especially if you have a slightly higher than normal testosterone count, you're going to think that you can fight whether or not you actually can. They have in their head this idea that I can go coup my way out of this. Shit. I can power up based on anger and Red Bull or whatever and win a fight when the difference between somebody who's trained for like just six months, it's astronomical. The amount of ability that's there just from learning the basics. Frost, welcome to the show. Hey, great to be here. This is awesome. Uh, it's been a few days now. We've had enough time for the lessons from Will Smith slapping Chris Rock to percolate <laughs> around the internet and their philosophical significance to embed themselves. What were your thoughts when you first saw that and what are your thoughts now having had time to reflect on it? Well, like every single human being that is even moderately aware of this, I had my own take on this and it was it was basically that uh, you know, I I thought Will Smith could hit harder, you know. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's not the most earnest uh, way of looking at that. Yeah, I mean, he's I don't think he was trying to knock Chris Rock's head off. Um, a lot of people, given what we do uh, at Bullshito, thought, oh, it was a work. It was staged. It was, you know, so the Oscars. Nobody cares about him anymore. And now we're all talking about it. So um, I don't have strong opinions one way or another. But, yeah, I, I was just like, hey, action movies aren't reality. Let's just take this opportunity to remind you of that. So. Interesting one. I, On balance, I don't think that it's a fake event. I don't think it makes as much sense. I'd heard that if it came about through whatever your equivalent of Ofcom regulators are, that they'd staged this and that in the script for it had been swear words, that they would be the Oscars would be looked at being slapped with like a ten million dollar fine. That if you were to purposefully you can accidentally say swear words and it's about a quarter of a million. I was with a guy from Hollywood yesterday on uh Oof. the Drinking Bros podcast. If you script a swear word in and it's not supposed to be there, it's some insane fee, some ridiculous. So I think that that seems unlikely. And just the reactions from pretty much everyone, including if you play the tape a bit longer and you see Chris try to get himself kind of back to what's happening. Yeah. I'm aware he's an actor and oh, that's their job. But dude, that's some he should have got an Oscar for how he dealt with the slap if that slap was a fake slap. Yeah, no, I mean, he was, he was great. And he looked like he was in some, you know, you could see the wheels turning in his head. He was like trying to come up with, well, how do I spin this and keep the show going? And, and yeah, and somebody was like, uh, well, it, he, I'm surprised he didn't get knocked out. And my joke, you know, was that, oh, uh, well, his, he's not Chris paper after all. Oh, very so. funny. Very, very, very yeah, funny. I'm like, yeah. Well, I, I go for low hanging fruit. The, you've seen those slap fighting championships, right? Yes. Those are awesome. I, I love that. Is there a concern is there a concern with that slap fighting stuff that we're basically watching people get CTE live on like on air for our entertainment? I mean, that would be the same thing for the UFC. Like any, you know, at any least you're allowed to defend yourself. Yes, but I mean, come on, the, statistically, you're going to get hit, you know, probably fewer times uh, in a slap competition than you are in the UFC. Yeah, that's fair. So that's fair. So yeah, what about what about your reflections on? Why, whether Will should have reacted, shouldn't have reacted. Um, there's a whole spectrum of things that we could talk about with that, with regards to um, a man's role in, you know, defending the honor of his wife. And, uh, oh, man, that you throw out the, uh, throw out the, the buzz phrase, uh, toxic masculinity, whether that plays a role in it. Um, I mean, obviously, Jada, Jada Pinkett Smith can defend herself. Uh, she she doesn't have she doesn't lack for a uh, you know the the wits or the charmer and the ability to to be sassy back in a situation like that. So I don't know. Um, I honestly couldn't even say what I would do in the same situation. I know uh, it would be a step between what he did, what Will Smith did, and what Ted Cruz didn't do when somebody made fun of his wife. What's the is, Ted Cruz situation? Oh, uh, Ted Cruz um, did in the campaign in uh, 2016. Donald Trump basically just straight up called Ted Cruz's wife ugly. He's like, oh, you're married to an ugly woman or some some sort of thing. And then Ted Cruz's response to that was to help him campaign. So ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's, it's that's a running seems... joke here in Texas, you know. <laughs> okay. Um, so I got a YouGov poll the day after 
this happened. One in five Brits think it was acceptable for Will Smith to hit Chris Rock at the Oscars. Uh, a majority of Britons, 57%, say that Smith hitting Rock was not acceptable. 22% say that Smith's actions were acceptable. Men, 26%, were slightly more likely than women, 17%, to say his actions were acceptable, perhaps unsurprisingly. Uh, taking offence, many people might sympathise with Will Smith taking uh, regarding the joke made about his wife Jada Pinkett Smith's alopecia hair loss, but how many Britons reacted in the same way as Smith when they felt offended? 14% say that they have punched or hit someone in response to something mm -hmm. offensive. That is a very low number, and I think speaks a lot to the uh, British passive aggressiveness. Most Britons, 80%, however, have refrained from doing so. Men, 20%, are twice as likely as women, 9% to have lashed out physically. This was an interesting one, and this comes to what you just said there. Honor bound, some have suggested that Jada Pinkett Smith didn't need her husband to defend her honor in this way, and that this notion is outdated. But when asked today, three quarters of Britons, 77%, said it is appropriate for a husband to defend his wife's honor if another person offends them. One in 10, 10%, said that it is not appropriate for them to do so. And women, 79%, are more likely than men at 75% to say it is appropriate for a husband to defend his wife's honor. I thought that was quite interesting. Yeah, no, I mean, I, there's there are deeply rooted, evolved reasons for that. Um, just, I mean, at the, uh, the level of a woman who sees that her husband is not going to do anything, just let it happen, it's probably not going to be... Um, He's probably not going to be her husband for very long just because, I mean, you, you want to know that that even irrespective of genders, you want to know that that person is, uh, as they would say, down for you to, you know, the ride or die kind of stuff. So you don't you, you want to know that the person you're with, it, it would be good in a situation like that. It's got your back. And uh, but more so for men, because traditionally we are seen as the gender that does the more physical sort of interactions with world responding to threats and, and, and that sort of thing. So, Would it have yeah. been different, uh, do you think, if Jada had gone up and slapped him? Uh, absolutely. It would have been a 100% different conversation. And I think the vast majority of people would have cheered it on. And I, I think people would have even thought that was more scripted. Because, uh, first of all, she would have gotten away with it completely. Uh, there, there would have been no controversy, minus a few people that are, you know, on the, the far, the manosphere, you know, types. of like, how dare she? How can she slap? That kind of thing. But, um... No, I, I, I think that would have been the ideal scenario. And, and if he was just sitting back there with the camera on him, just clapping, I mean, that would be would have been the perfect way, minus, you know, just a conversation to resolve that issue. Well, I mean, if Will had leaned over and said, darling, darling, I really think that you should go up and whack him. That might have taken away a little bit of the spontaneity. There is there's definitely an argument to be made that um, kind of like in roast battles, if you go to an award ceremony now, you know what you're in for, whether it's Kevin Hart or Ricky Gervais or Chris Rock that's presenting it. It's kind of the job of the comedian to take the wankiness out of this highfalutin, very sort of bourgeois event by yeah. going around the room and pointing at all of the hypocrisies of Hollywood and making fun of people and stuff like that. So, yeah. I mean... Out of all of the jokes that you can make about Will Smith's wife, especially with Will Smith in the room, that's quite a lowball one. There's, you know, stories about him being cooked by his own wife. There's videos of him having podcast episodes and stuff. And I mean, that that to me is a another interesting conversation around why we have a particular concern about going after groups. Let's say that Chris Rock had said something racist up on stage, right, against any group condemned across the world. But the insult about one particular person is significantly more painful to that person as opposed to an entire group. And yet, everybody's fine for that joke about an individual person to go, but not fine for a joke about an entire group to go. I find that an interesting disparity between the way that we judge hurting feelings or making value judgments goes. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think that uh, had he, I mean, we, we would have absolutely, everybody, well, most people, most decent people would have taken exception to him making fun of the alopecia community. You know, I mean, that is, but, but going after, and then again, um, Jada herself isn't exactly the A-list celebrity that Will Smith is. So going after Will Smith, there's a, there's also a power imbalance there. You're, there's the, I hate the term punching down. Because yeah. Sometimes yeah, yeah. no matter where you are, you, you know, you kind of deserve to get punched in some, you know, metaphorical sense, uh, if not literal, but, um, it's not 
going after Jada, Jada Pinkett Smith is a totally different scenario than going after Will Smith, who is, you know, a plus list Hollywood, you know, almost at this point royalty now. Uh, some whole generations have grown up with the guy. Uh, and then, you know, she's, you know, her career is not exactly at the same level. So, and she's been going through some stuff and yeah, there's so many different factors at play here that, you know, I, I welcome all the different takes on it. So, I mean, personally, I'm just, uh, po- the, focused on the part where he his hand contacts the other guy's face. Cause you know, that's what we're predisposed to look at. Well, you are pretty experienced with this, right? Your background is in fighting, calling out fighting, understanding what it yeah. means to sort of deploy physical aggression. And then also having online confrontations that sometimes end up in physical aggression. Yeah. Yeah. Bullshito, um, got its start. Uh, Oh God, back in 2002, almost two decades. Now this may, it'll be 20 years. Um, where it was just a bunch of uh, MMA athletes, martial artists, et cetera, people that are actively training, calling out the people that are just pretending to be tough guys uh, in the martial arts. Well, we've long since expanded our topic range to more things, but back then, it, it you know this is what we were into, and this is what seemed to be important because a lot of people had no idea what a real fight looked like, so they had grown up in the '80s with the you know karate kung fu action films and all the ridiculous. Yeah, especially Steven Seagal. That, I've got a great story with that. I, I never refrain from sharing uh, about Steven Seagal. Um, and, but anyway, the um, so uh, the internet was was new. Online communities were new. Uh, this was before people were using the word meme even. Uh, there were well, there was no Facebook. There wasn't even a MySpace back then. So we all kind of got together and just hashed out our own little uh, space where we could call these people out without being you know censored or shut down or anything like that. And uh, it got interesting and um. I ended up being the uh, like accidentally Tyler Durden in a sense, because we have all these people like, yeah, well you're full of shit. You're full of shit. And we'd have these things where people would get together and just beat the crap out of each other. And we called them throwdowns. What's it like so, running a real life fight club? Oh, uh, it, it was awesome. Uh, I don't think there were no surprisingly, there were no real serious legal consequences for the, the fighting because it was within a martial arts context. I mean, these people are sparring. It's all, you know, consensual. Yeah. We may not have had exactly uh, like waivers or things signed or anybody got like a like clearance from their doctor or anything official because it wasn't sanctioned. But, you know, guys would show up and, you know, throw blows. And it was it was cool. It was like, you know, the golden area of the Internet, as far as I'm concerned. But this was the same time that Kimbo Slice would have probably ah. been doing backyard brawls for money. Yes. Yeah. Kimbo Slice, uh, he kind of did his own thing. And I think it was like Florida was where he was coming up. The like guys are just throwing punches and stuff. And we just. We're doing the same thing, but those those guys are sort of unregulated, uh, like not even associated with martial arts at all. They were just dudes that were uh, like banging. It was they were people was, that wanted to throw awesome. hands. I, it feels like yes. you guys were trying to stress test different martial arts uh, and or how much bullshit uh, certain people were exactly. talking about online. We would invite people to come and come to the events. Most of them were friendly, but every now and then there was some dude who's like, yeah, man, uh, you guys, I don't like the, what you've been saying about us. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to show up and, and, uh, you know, it, it was usually hilarious. Uh, we had, we had a couple of famous incidents that are, uh, still on the internet somewhere. Uh, like one guy showed up at a, um, to, to fight a dude in, in a, like a backfield somewhere. He actually left like a comic convention because he was dressed up in cosplay and showed up to fight the dude. The, the guy from Bullshito was in cosplay and showed up to fight the guy in, in the backyard of somebody's house. And um, they beat his ass dressed as like Lupin or some anime character. And so, yeah, that, that dude's awesome. Um, and then we've had one guy that uh, we had a whole crew of people drive like 16 hours from uh, was it Austin to D.C. to Maryland area or something to fight a dude in a parking lot um, over like some challenges. Like he was like talking about his kung fu ability and um, to, the fight itself didn't happen, but a fight between the two people that had gone with the, those two groups ended up doing. And it was it was it was pretty cool. A guy ended up on his back and uh, got punched a few times. And yeah, so we, we used to have fun. What were the most common martial arts that were the ones that were being called out? And what were the most common ones that were being used to stress test the bullshit? Well, usually it was somebody that had trained in mixed martial arts or Brazilian jiu-jitsu specifically, because when, when you do those things, you know exactly what your limitations are because the guys that are, uh, and, and girls that are going, uh, that are rolling, that are sparring in the classroom, they, they're sparring. They're, they're seeing what they can get away with and a very loose open rule set where, I mean, short of, you know, 
nasty stuff like poking somebody in the eye or, you know, trying to bite or that kind of thing. UFC sort of rules, you know what your limitations are. And so the guys that do the sparring like Aikido, uh, which basically has no sparring or uh, styles like Wing Chun or just other, other forms of Kung Fu, not all of them, but most of them, they don't do any sparring at all. So they would um, they would be hurt. Their, their images would be hurt by the fact that they had up until we came along or, you know, people similar to us had um, everybody just had assumed that, you know, you guys. Yeah, I mean, you, you do this, you know, you train for 10 years. You're, you're probably a badass and, you know, guys like to be thought of as badasses. So, yeah, they, their feelings get hurt when you're like, dude, you, you've never even taken a punch in your life. How do you know that, you know, you, all this floppy crap that you're doing is going to help? Have so. you ever done a whatever more traditional martial art like a Lao Ga or a Kung Fu or a Karate or so? Well, I guess Karate is relatively um, applicable in some aspects. But what about the more fluffy stuff? Have you ever tried to do that? I um, personally, uh, like when I was first getting into martial arts, this way back in the 90s, I, uh, I did a little Wushu uh, and some Wing Chun. Uh, so, I mean, I, I have familiarity with that. Um, and then, you know, uh, it, the UFC came along and we were like, hmm, that'd be cool to see some of those dudes in that. And then, you know, just, you just didn't. So didn't do I think there was well. one guy. There was one guy that did Wing Chun in the UFC and he um, immediately got put on his back and punched into, um, you know, the mat. So, yeah. The reason that I say that is I did Lao Ga for probably six years when I was in my teens and it was a real formative part of growing up i was doing tai chi i was teaching tai chi as well um and it's strange thinking now in a world that's stress tested by ufc i mean it would have been stress tested it was like 2004 2000 like one to 2006 or something like that um i wonder whether you still see a value in people doing those more traditional styles of martial arts i actually i do i do i'm not like I guess the, the the term would be a, a bigot against those those sorts of things. <laughs> First of all, there's the the cultural relevance and the I mean, there some of those things are just beautiful to see. Uh, like even an Aikido, I'm, I bag on Aikido all the time because it's it, it's a goofy style. It was created by by a weird you know cultish you know vegan Japanese hippie guy. Um, but uh, I there there's there's beauty in the motion. It is a in a way almost a form of dance uh, that reflects older things. And I can even rationalize how some of that would have been applicable to a battlefield hundreds of years ago. It's just so far removed from that context. It's not practical, practical to, you know, doing anything today. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think Tai Chi, um, especially for the movement, you know, it's just like a sort of walking yoga, you know, keep yourself limber as you age and that kind of thing. That's, that's great. That's good stuff. I really enjoyed so, it. And it was super formative. I think that you're right. When you, the problem comes when you start talking about applicability and it's the further away from UFC. I mean, what else, what else is there? I'm going to guess Brazilian jiu-jitsu, you're straight up boxing, kickboxing, Thai boxing, samba, and then wrestling. Are those yep. probably like the main styles? Yeah, is there anything I mean, that, missing from that? really that? is. No, I mean, I, uh, I mean, there has been some of the uh, Kyokushin karate. I think uh, was it Leo de Machida? Is that the, the one that that's, do, is that the one that where they try and punch each other in the sternum? It's a full contact, just not to the face. You can kick to the head, but you can't punch to the head. What so, about, yeah. What's that one that um, Michael Page did? Shoot fighting. Shoot fighting. Uh, yeah, I mean, well, that's uh, to my knowledge, that's just a um, uh, it's just another rule set. So, and there was uh, there were I think one of those. No, oh, Pancrase was the one where you you had to use open hands. So that was back in the so day. That's what Will Boston Smith should have learned. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, there were a couple KOs from open hand KOs for some of those dudes. Shit. And Will Can you imagine if Will Smith had, had had KO'd Chris Rock with a slap? <laughs> I'm just going to uh, use Chris. I mean, I'm going to use Chris Rock and Will Smith now as the benchmark for the rest of time for whether or yeah. not something's an effective strategy in martial arts. Yeah, I, I, yeah, that, that works. In fact, I, I really want to give Chris Rock credit for taking that, uh, assuming, and I'm leaning towards the fact that it was real, assuming that it was. Yeah, he 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 took that like a champ. I mean, he just he rolled with the uh, the slap, and like I said, you can knock somebody out with a damn slap, especially if the palm of your hand. It wasn't like, a light right one, man. He's, he's, Will Smith's not a small dude. He's trained for pretty much all of his life, and yeah, he's a yeah. bigger guy. For anyone as well that hasn't ever been slapped or hit, the sensation of being fully slapped in the face is pretty shocking. Like there's the flood of everything that just comes through you. Oh, yeah. You go. 
I've just been fucking slapped. <laughs> yeah. You, you're completely shocked. So yeah, I um I think you're right. I think one of many, many interesting lessons to take from that is Chris Rock's ability to hold his poise in that is pretty impressive. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, you can see the wheels turning. He was like, how can I, you know, follow this up with a, with a joke or something? And I think what he said was, uh, I was like, well, that was the best moment in Oscar history. So <laughs> good for that dude, man. What um, about, what do you think about the importance of learning how to fight? I have this conversation a lot with uh, friends who are untrained in a very applicable style of martial arts, right? Like a, an MMA or a boxing or a, a, a Bra- yeah. Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Do you think that it is, I wouldn't say a moral obligation, but you could even say that um, a quasi necessity for especially men to perhaps spend some time learning how to fight? Yeah, well, yeah, absolutely. Because, I mean, our, especially if you have a, like a slightly higher than normal testosterone count, you're going to think that you can fight whether or not you actually can. I mean, you, you run into so many dudes that are like, man, I, I just see red and I just start throwing, you know, it's like they have in this, in their head, this idea that, yeah, it's just, I can go coop my way out of this shit. I can power up this based on anger and Red Bull or whatever and, and win a fight when the difference between, and this is one of the things I try to explain to a lot of people, the difference between somebody who's trained for like just six months in a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or a Muay Thai or, or even boxing or wrestling versus somebody who's, you know, watched those things on TV, maybe it is it's, it's astronomical. The, the amount of ability that that's there just from learning the basics. So yeah, if you care about the people around you, uh, whether you're a man or a woman, but I mean, especially dudes, cause we fall into that role a lot. You should be physically capable to handle a situation like that, whether it's, you know, you're confident enough that if it comes to that, you can, you can handle it. And, but that also reinforces your ability to deescalate because you know, at the end of the day, de-escalating, even if you have to take a little bit of hurt to your pride, doesn't really hurt your pride as much as if you were unsure that you could kick that dude's ass. So it's it's easier to, to back down from a fight. You're like, okay, yeah, man, you're, you're okay, you're, you're a tough guy. Um, in, in a situation like that, when you know that if if you had to, you would have just tore him up. Well, so, I the, mean, the difference there is kind of like the difference between being homeless or going camping. One of them is a choice, and the other one is mandated on you. It's what Perfect. Peterson like says. Yeah. Pe- Peterson says, you know, uh, a harmless man is not a good man. A good man is a very dangerous man that has that under voluntary control. And that's the difference. You're backing down because it's your choice to, because you want to de-escalate, as opposed to you're backing down because that's the only option that you have that doesn't involve you getting the shit kicked out of you. Yeah, absolutely. It's the uh, uh, better to be a uh, warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. Yeah, yeah. that's... that's I, a, I mean... Yeah. Um... <laughs> I, I, it's it's interesting. Uh, there's a, a part of me that, that knows a bunch of dudes that I think would really, really benefit from spending a year or a couple of years doing some Brazilian jiu-jitsu or some, some striking because I think there's a lot of nervous energy around masculinity uh, that comes out due to a, a fear of inferiority if anything was to get physical. And I think that based on what I see, I'm right next to the sauna place that I go to in Austin. Have you been to Kuya yet? Uh, I've, I've seen it, yeah. Yeah, it's Austin? opposite You're... 10th. Yeah, opposite 10th, 10th planet. Yes, I'm in Austin as well. We could have just shouted it out oh. the window. I, oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, I'm just down the road. We, we got hit by the tornado last week. Oh, shit, yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, Kuya, which is there, I get a lot of the 10th planet guys that are coming in, and I'll be hearing them talk. And all of them are so softly spoken. These Brazilian kids... 17 years old with full cauliflower ears but they're all coming in and they're all really quietly talking about whatever it is that they've got going on and uh yeah there's just a sense of sort of poise and certainty that those guys have that i think a lot of um dudes that i know i've worked the front door of nightclubs for 15 years as a club promoter and i've watched a lot of situations in which people who don't know how to fight have tried to fight probably because of a fear that they don't know how to fight yeah yeah, I mean, it's. Uh, I like to compare it to a Chihuahua. You know, a Chihuahua knows he's going to get his ass kicked, but he's 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 going to snap and bark and growl as much as he possibly can to convince you that he's not going to get his ass kicked. So there's there's a little bit of that at play, and yeah, it's the overconfidence thing. It's just we're we're dudes are 
we're just host to a whole cocktail of chemicals that send like all these signals to us. Like you need to fight or, you know, if you don't fight, then, you know, you're going to regret it in the future or, or all these sorts of things. And they, they lead to bad decisions. And the, the older you get, the easier it is to manage those because you have experience. But, um, man, being a, a, a teenage dude with a, with a little bit of a, you know, like tea running through you, you're, I mean, it's easy to go the wrong direction with, with some choices. So. You look at the violent crime risk for men, and I think it's between 26 and 29, and it just falls off a cliff. You know, and this is why the vast majority of gang members are at that young age. I mean, also, if you've been in a gang for 10 years since the age of 16 or something, you're probably maybe dead or in jail or one of a bunch of other things. But yeah, um, yeah one of the best things that I think that you could do for young men, especially ones that might live in an impoverished neighborhood or guys that have got a little bit more of antisocial behavior tendencies when they're young, is to try and get them into a place where they can funnel that aggression, right? Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Create a positive outcome for that as opposed to it happening on the street. Yeah, no, in fact, uh, er every time that, that, that situation comes up, you see a kid in school, public schools aren't going to do that. They're not going to say, Hey, you're, you should go that we barely, barely even have contact sports in public schools anymore. So I remember when I was a kid and this was some podunk rural Texas, uh, like they would never do this today. This is like in late eighties. Actually. Um, we did boxing in gym class. You know, we, we put on big, you know, fluffy gloves and we're like just swinging at each other. And there's no way you could do that today. So some nice 30 ounce, huge mitts that you've got, like yeah. those comedy ones that you get at a town like fair. Sock and boppers, you know, the toddler toys. But, uh, you know, it, it was great. I remember being impressed with my ability because I was, you know, less than confident. I was a scrawny kid. I, uh, yeah, I was a scrawny, nerdy kid. And so there's this kid I didn't like. And of course, the coaches paired us up because, you know, they're, they're dicks and that's what coaches do. But, um, so I mean, I just floored the guy. I just spun him around. I threw a punch and yeah, he went, you know, like a cartoon top. And I was like, huh, I might have a, a affinity for this sort of thing. So, but yeah, it was, it, we need that. We need, um, not all violence in the sense of the, the sociological, you know, ivory tower academic sense of the term it, is necessarily a, a thing we should avoid. Uh, if we're learning to express that in a healthy, uh, consensual, reasonably safe manner, uh, it's probably so much better than just, you know, letting people do whatever they're going to do without any supervision. So. One of the things that I've realized is that a lot of the time, policymakers and people that are doing public commentary about big, important, whatever they consider to be important rules, aren't built the same as the people that they're making the rules for. So yes. one of the good examples of this is the feminist movement when they decided that getting rid of chivalry would be a good way to further equalize the, the world for women, that a man holding a door open for a woman or men being taught very, very aggressively that you shouldn't hit a woman, you shouldn't do blah, 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 because women are their own. That was a bourgeois idea that didn't take into account that women from slightly different backgrounds where men perhaps didn't have as many guardrails in on their behavior were benefiting from chivalry still being a thing. And that as soon as you get rid of that reason for men to decide to do it simply because it's a norm in terms of respect, a lot of women that were from different backgrounds to those that were promoting the uh, the reduction of the behavior were the ones that were going to suffer. And it kind of feels like the same with regards to violence as well, that most of the people who are going to talk about the toxic masculine effect of someone going into an MMA gym and learning how to punch somebody in the face, whether that be a politician or somebody that writes in the media, it's very unlikely if you've got to that sort of a position in society that you are the sort of person who would need a violent outlook or a, an outlet for you when you were a 13 year old raging with adolescent hormones. Yeah. I mean, the, the similar sort of like detached from a ground ground reality thing that comes in like in far, discussions of firearms as well. It's like, why would anybody need a firearm at their house to protect, you know, well, the cops are always there in my neighborhood. You know, they'll, they'll show up within two minutes if I call. Yeah, that's not how it is for everyone else. Everyone doesn't live in your, your very, in your, your walled community with like security and, and this and that. So yeah, policy needs to be made for the people that suffer the most. It needs to be focused on those who are more likely to be victims and not necessarily the, the people that are just looking at life through their very stunted small lenses. 
So we have very differing opinions about whether or not to engage in arguments online. Can you <laughs> can you please put forward your uh, proposition about why you do it? My okay, uh, but the people I I've actually ri- written this down in a piece, but um, the the idea is that a lot of people will say don't argue with idiots. Because uh, I mean, the, the idiot. There's like so many. Mark Twain had a quote. It's like uh, he'll uh, like pull you down with his his experience, or don't. Um, it's like playing ch- chicken or chess with a with a pigeon. They'll just knock over all the pieces and shit on the board. So um, I look at it from a a longer term sort of spectrum. So the you should argue with idiots if the if there's an audience. So if it's just you and an idiot, I mean you're. Unless you genuinely care about that person and you you want to steer them in the right right direction, you want to make them a non idiot. Yeah, they're, they're, that would probably be a waste of your time. But when it when you argue with an idiot in front of an audience, just like you're having a debate with somebody, you're you're talking for the audience. So just don't focus so much on the person that you're that you're arguing with, as in make the points that other people who are maybe on the edge uh, or the you know the, they could go the wrong way. They, they could go from, you know, believing in, you know, modern medicine to uh, homeopathy or something like that. So steer that argument for those. Those are your audience. The the idiot in the argument is just your punching bag. Are you so saying just show are you, you saying do. that online arguing is a spectator sport? It absolutely is. In fact, the the algorithms for those things are so tailored now to to get that to the engagement, because, you know, a, a Twitter thread of like three people all agreeing on you know whatever it is is nothing it doesn't no, nobody's gonna tune in to, to look at that but of like just people piling on and just like just this that and sub tweets and threads and you know yeah cancel mobs and all that shit yeah that that's what gets people engaged so of course so i mean yeah you have to play in that battle because there are some people out there that are pretty good at that and they're doing it for you know either selfish or the absolute wrong reasons so it's one of those, uh, on, honestly, on some level, not to make it sound too grandiose, but you know, all that's needed for uh, was it the Edmund Burke quote? I think was it for uh, for evil to triumph is good men to do nothing. That kind of thing. Are you are, are you Burke. saying that your your online arguments are a public service? Uh, actually, and they literally are now. Spectator sport. We're, I mean, personally, I don't know. My arguments are kind of you know for my own benefit, but as the organization that we run, yeah, we're we're a nonprofit educational media foundation, so. Yeah, they're, we're trying to do some good, and you know, maybe if we have a little fun in it, it's it's an incidental. So, so I think I think it's only because of the presence of people like you and 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 the people that you argue with that I'm able to take my stance, which is this is somebody's fight, but it's never my fight. Like for me, an online argument, the the cost to benefit ratio is just way 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 off, and I do think that. There are some people, I mean, Chris Kavanaugh is a perfect example of this. I, every so often, someone will tag me in a uh, halfway through as an example. Or, you know, when this is one of the wor- most annoying things, right, about Twitter. Someone's having a big argument. Early on in the exchange, you somehow become tagged as an example or a whatever. And then for the remainder of the day, you have now been dry, like by by the scruff of your neck or by the the seat of your pants. You're now mentions are just annihilated by yep. everyone. And you're just like desperately hoping that someone decides to quote tweet it, which is kind of like the ejector seat button that means that you're yep. no longer a part of this thread. And it's happened with <laughs> me where I've been kind of intru- tagged in at one point into a, a Chris Kavanaugh thing, and it makes me feel physically uncomfortable because I know that this is going to be a battle of attrition. This isn't yeah. going to be something that's going to be let go. This is going to go on for many, many tens of replies. And uh, yeah, I I salute you for your uh, patience or perseverance or boredom that that sort of pushes you to be able to do this online. But dude, it's it's not for me. Yeah, no. I mean, you, you have to waste so much time in it. And if you're not seeing, if you're not trying specifically to affect some kind of change, if you're just trying to engage with ideas then I, I have no, I don't begrudge anyone for saying like, yeah, this is ridiculous. I'm, you know, I'm going to go put out. my phone down. Um, yeah, I'm going to walk outside, touch grass. So what's I the, think that's what they're saying now. What's the Steven Seagal stories? I want to know more about oh, him. And you must have okay. some others about crazy fake martial artists. Give us some of those. The, the Steven Seagal story is, um, and I think 
I, actually, I don't give a shit whether he's uh, you know offended because you know he gave up his citizenship and now he's a Russian, I think. So whatever. Um, so back in the day, uh, I think forget one of the movies, one of his three word movie titles. Um, he uh, hard to kill, like just kick the ass, whatever. He um he has a he had some something on the set and he was like talking shit, like man, uh, like all all this stuff and nobody could like choke me out. And that was that was the claim that he made. And um, one of the stuntmen happened to be judo Gene LaBelle. Gene LaBelle is legendary as a stuntman um, and, and as a martial artist. I mean, judo, just extraordinary guy. And he does not get enough respect and love over the years. I, I think he's dead. Uh, but, you know, anyway, so he was he was in so many movies now that if, if you look through all the old 80s and 90s and before movies, Bruce Lee stuff, um, you, you can see him in the background. You play spot Gene LaBelle. But um, Gene LaBelle was on the set. He's like, I'll take you up on that bet. And um, so as the story goes, um, I'm not sure whether or not Steven Seagal was wearing brown pants when he showed up to the set that day, but he certainly left wearing brown pants. And then lawyers got involved and Gene was like, you know, so- sued for you know, like, you know, sign a non-disclosure and all that shit. So, but yeah, the Gene LaBelle like put him in a rear naked joke and made a uh, Steven Seagal shit his pants. Wow. Yeah. And I, I've had this confirmed by several people in the industry. Um, and then over the years, it, it, so I have high confidence. A lot of faith. An urban legend. S- Steven yeah. Seagal pooped himself. Oh yeah. Plus, I mean, I also want to believe it. So yeah. Well, that's that whatever confirmation bias against Steven Seagal. I think <laughs> yeah. everybody has that. What else then? Cause there's been there was like this period, I suppose. I don't know what the Wonder Years would have been when video cassettes you were able to sell of these magic dojos, and you've got these old and styly videos of non-touch knockouts and force yes. pushing and chi energy and shit like that. What wasn't wasn't that movie that uh, what's his face starred in about the fighting pit? Wasn't that based on a fake story as well? Oh, uh, yeah. Van Damme played, uh, Frank Dukes. In, and he was, was Blood Sport. Fra- yeah. And he was, that was a fake story, right? Yeah. Frank Dukes is a real person. Um, but his whole story is manufactured. Like he was a, a CIA ninja, you know, guy that fought an underground tournament and like in Asia called the Kumite, um, of back in the day, actually, this was even before we got involved in this. Uh, I, think was it soldier of fortune magazine some some um some publication that wasn't exactly mainstream like doug the, like did all the, the actual legwork on this tracked down his tournament trophy to a um to a trophy store right down the street from his house so uh, it just i mean they they source it the whole story is bullshit but frank dukes is still out there like giving ninja seminars um and a lot of in europe because you know very few people in the U.S. believe in ninjas now, unless they're into anime. But um, yeah, so he, he's still trying to cash in on that cow. And then there was a Sheeta Kim, who um, was one of the first big guys we tangled with. Sheeta Kim published a bunch of books in the '80s, like Ninja Secrets of Invisibility or Ninja Magic Skills or this or that. And so we're like, okay. And he had this uh, ten thousand dollar challenge. He's like, I can defeat anybody. Just put ten thousand dollars up. So one of the members of our forums, it's like cashed out ten thousand dollars and put it in bill stacks of bills on his desk and like well, let's do this and then you know the hemming and the hawing and the just started and so yeah we we punked him out and um oh god I, I don't want to tell the story because this is this is the nerdiest thing that anyone's ever heard and, and every time i tell this i feel a little a little ashamed but so instead of fighting somebody from bullshito he went on wikipedia and started threatening the uh, founder of Wikipedia, Jim Wales, and like started saying, well, we should take down the Bullshito article and take down the article about me because it included the information about us, um, you know, calling him out and his $10,000 challenge was BS. And so Jim Wales himself, the guy, the head of the Wikimedia Foundation, deleted Ashita Kim's article off Wikipedia. And so I'm like, how is this a real world thing where... I'm and uh, Ashita Kim accused him of being in a rival ninja gang. Uh, It was just the most batshit. This is this could only happen in the earlier days of the internet, where you know you could actually interact with people. And I was, it was so wild. And it's hard to tell this story and expect people to believe me, but it's just it was a smaller world back then. I love the fact that this guy, everything to him, is framed through ninja gangs or not. Yeah. Like everything that occurs, the reason that Will Smith slapped Chris Rock is because they were in rival ninja <laughs> gangs. Yeah. 
Oh Katie. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We were, we were a different clan or something, whatever. Uh, we, we eventually tracked him down to, uh, the re- guy's real name was Radford Davis. He lived in a trailer in Florida. Um, you know, I, I think we had somebody, uh, dig through his garage or his, uh, garbage to, uh, like confirm that it was, a uh, it w- was really the same guy and, and stuff like that. So and we've, we've done a few things. Uh, we're, I don't know if it, you should be proud of that, but I mean, the guy just, there's so many people. I remember seeing those books on bookshelves as a kid at, at like a bookstore. It's like Ninja Magic and Invisibility. And I can see how you get taken in by that. It sounds cool as hell. What were you looking at to do with chiropractors? Because I've heard rumors about the efficacy of uh, ch- chiropody, what a, what, a, what a chiropractic work. Yeah. Uh, I've heard sort of rumors about this for ages. What's the what's the actual breakdown of of where it came from and whether it's effective or not? So, uh, chiropractic uh, was created in the late 1800s by a man named D.D. Palmer. D.D. Palmer, up until then, had been like sort of a for the time a grifter, snake oil salesman. I think you know professionally he like like did grocery distributions or something until one day, uh, as the story goes. He, he cracked somebody's back because, you know, I mean, cracking your back makes you feel better. And then all of a sudden, and keep in mind that this is in the, the time period where there was a lot of interest in spiritualism and um, alter- science was just getting rolling and real scientific method kind of stuff. And we're still figuring out. I think they had just started washing their hands before operating on people at the time. And so D.D. Palmer's story that he went public with to, to say the new field of uh, chiropractic, whatever, however they, they say it, is – um was imparted to him in a dream by a ghost doctor, by a dead ghost doctor. So somehow that became a thing. I mean, yeah, with relentless marketer, I mean, like Steve Jobs level marketing. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, the thing that muddies the water on chiropractic is that a lot of the people that do chiropractic just want to help, uh, just basically want to be physiotherapists, just, just want to do physical therapy, occupational therapy, that stuff, and get you back to you know, get your skeletal, your mus- muscles and everything like that all back working properly. Because, you know, I think about it, most people sit on their ass all day or have bad posture or habits like that. And it's a necessary service. Your general practitioner is not going to give a shit about that. They're going to, you know, they, even especially in the U.S., they're going to give you, you know, five minutes of attention, prescribe you something and, you know, cash in money. But so chiropractors have filled in a gap where a lot of people like, I, I need this kind of, I need something to help me out. Cause I got a shitty mattress and you know, I, I I'm on my feet all day and you know, so my back hurts. Yeah, it, it's going to hurt. And the part of chiropractic that works is the actual evidence-based medicine because they, they do some of that. They do chiropractors have, when you go to chiropractor school, you learn the, the real things, you learn the stuff that works, but you're also, the difference is that you're taught things like, uh, subluxations, um, which are, are not a thing. What's up? That, that, uh, it's basically it, the, the bones are misaligned. And so you're bringing them back into line. Usually, uh, like a, a chiropractic subluxation is different than a, an actual medical one where it, things are really the hell out of whack. Chiropractic is like, Oh, well, there's just a, you got to just slightly adjust the spine. No chiropractic teaches, uh, that you in, in its true form, chiropractic teaches that you can cure any disease by adjusting the spine. And that's well, patently ridiculous. There's also another central, uh, concept of chiropractic called the innate which is a like a life force, almost like a chi sort of thing that um, you won't hear a lot of the more uh, contemporary, the, the ones that are out there talking about chiropractors. They, they won't sell it to you, just like Scientologists won't talk about Xenu, but it, it's there. And so that's another fundamental part of their, their practice. And so you can get all the things that work out of chiropractors you can get from a physiotherapist. But the problem is, chiropractors are easier to see they're more available there and they do provide what feels like relief when you get your back cracked it feels good the problem is then they'll they'll take that and expand it and then you'll see videos of chiropractors cranking the necks of infants or uh, my, my favorite one is i don't know i guess this guy's a celebrity uh, chiropractor on youtube or something i don't know the dude's name but uh, there's a video of him taking like a hammer and like a chisel device and just he has it right up against the dude's tailbone and he's just hammering it just whacking the shit out of it with a big old smile on his face. I'm like, no, please. I mean, unless you're doing that for as, as a stunt or like an episode of Jackass. No, that's not a medical thing. So 
you can get all the benefits of a chiropractor by seeing a physical therapist. Problem is that they're harder to access. And that's the problem with a lot of the alternative medicine out there. It's hard to get good medicine medicine. It's hard to get seen by somebody that's an expert. Why do people choose to become chiropractors if they want to be physical therapists? Is it easier to get the qualification to be a chiropractor? Well, it's absolutely easier to be to become a chiropractor. The the uh, the licensing and and regulation. The I mean, simply because it's it's less of an evidence based practice. So, I mean, bullshit is an inherent part of it. Can chiropractors call themselves doctor? Uh, you can be a doctor of chiropractic. So technically, yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. I was pretty sure that I'd seen something around that, that whatever, like Dr. Fletcher is, and it's a, a status thing, right? You say the word doctor, yeah. you don't well, know if you're you, a doctor of law or a doctor of yeah. chiropractic doctor or whatever. Of philosophy. Yeah. Pre- like precisely. A- what are you going to do? You're going to like debate my back better. Yeah, I know. It's like that 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 meme. It was like a, is there a doctor on board the airplane? Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm a doctor of philosophy. It's like, well, he's gonna die. It's like we're all gonna die. So, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So they, but they they take advantage of the fact that there is a doctor in the the uh, the fuzzy gray area in the public understanding of the word doctor versus physician, uh, which is the term that you know it's it's more you know appropriate to call the the medical doctors now because everybody can be a, you can be a doctor of education or basket weaving or whatever now <laughs> and um have you have you ever looked at um the evidence behind acupuncture or dry needling or anything like that um i haven't delved into it in depth i so i i'm loath to speak on that um because i'm not i i try not to chime in on stuff that i don't have a firm solid grip on it i mean my intuition says it's it's hokey as stuff because i know a lot of the things considered for example uh just to, to specify one thing traditional chinese medicine that term traditional chinese medicine is a entire um fabrication uh from the mao era of china because they were uh there was a uh, sort of deficit of actual physicians so they they wanted to like institute some sort of nationalistic health care and so they they ramped up the idea of traditional Chinese medicine. I mean, every every culture has its own traditional medicine, herbs, and you know that that sort of thing, and folk remedies. And so, but they played that up to us like a state thing. They they milled it in with the um, with like the the Chinese national identity for a while. And so it's still deeply entrenched in there. So you'll you'll find journals um, Chinese, which you know I'm not good enough on Duolingo to read it yet. Um, but uh, it's you'll find some that are just like. In fact, you'll find chiropractor journals that that sort of launder the the ideas that they're trying to put into the mainstream for medicine. Because as the saying goes, um, alternative medicine that actually works, it's just called medicine. It's just medicine. I have been thinking about this for quite a while, like what it is about these different pathways where people seem to show some sort of recovery afterward. And I had this guy on, David Robson, who's just written a book called The Expectation Effect. And man, this shit blew my mind. Absolutely blew my mind. So you understand the placebo effect, right? That yep. one of the most replicable effects in pharmacology is this panacea where the placebo effect accounts for sometimes over 50% of the impact of particular drugs. And The Expectation Effect, which is David's new book, goes through, this is present in anything that you care to care about, man. Like, absolutely everything my favorite there's um something called a nocebo as well which is a negative kind of like a hypochondriac that that creates their own um symptoms gluten intolerances were three percent 10 years ago and they are 30 percent of people now but think about the last 10 years we've had a lot of messaging around the dangers of gluten and bloating and hives and sensitivity and all that stuff and gluten-free yeah. foods as well which further reinforces that uh so researchers brought people who um did and didn't have biological gluten intolerances into the lab they fed all of these people food which did not contain gluten but told all of these people that it did hmm. and you ended up with people who weren't allergic to gluten who hadn't eaten gluten having a gluten reaction Yep, and this is the power of expectation, and I. This is where more degrees of freedom, I think, need to be given 
when we're talking about alternative solutions to things because yeah. you can't deny the fact that that person does have diarrhea, does have hives, does have bloating. The problem is it's not because of the reason that they think it is. And let's roll that into something else. Let's say that it is um, acupuncture, right? That somebody having faith... Let, let's get beyond the fact that simply spending a bit of time doing some self-care in a quiet room with some nice incense burning is a way to activate your parasympathetic nervous system for a while, which might be the only part of your entire week where you're not thinking about the kids and debt and whatever, which is yeah. a, a value in itself. Like, that's a genuine value outside of the expectation effect then on top of that the fact that you've done something that feels like self-care that makes you feel like you're in control so it's such a bizarre situation to be in right because the let's say i don't know the studies in acupuncture let's say that acupuncture doesn't have an impact on this person's injury or whatever it is they're trying to do but they feel better because of the very very robust and effective expectation effect you go okay did the acupuncture work well, it didn't work for the reason that you thought it worked. It didn't work on the mechanism that you thought it was working on. But you can't deny the fact that by going and doing this thing, the person feels better. So the outcome that you needed is created just not through the means that you thought it was. And it's just, it's such a, a really interesting like world to think about. The fact that what you're actually looking to do with a lot of people, especially if they're trying to fix ailments, is actually find the solution. I mean, what would be ideal would be to find the solution that speaks to them, which also assists them genuinely through some sort of biological mechanism. But failing that, finding a mechanism, which uh, finding a, uh, a solution which speaks to them to maximize that expectation effect is perhaps slightly disingenuous, but actually something that if you're thinking, what's the best way we can get good outcomes for this person, that could actually be a really, really effective way to look at it. Yeah, no, I don't begrudge anyone for seeking a remedy to alleviate their suffering, to reduce their suffering in any way. It's just the, the issue that I have, I mean, it's on two levels. The systemic issue is that we have a broken healthcare system with all the wrong incentives and all the wrong priorities, and it's just not serving the public health. So, but um, from a second level, on an individual level, if you find something that treats um, a, a problem and makes you feel better, okay, that's the symptoms, but you've got to treat the actual problem too. Like the, the biggest example that I always go back to is that Steve Jobs would be with us today if he hadn't sought out alternative um, means of treating his actual pancreatic cancer, you which is one of the 80% chance of survival, right? Absolutely. It was one of the few, most pancreatic cancers will just ruin you. will just kill you. But he had the one that was treatable by modern medicine. And he, instead he sought out all kinds of hokey nonsense. So yeah, I mean, BS killed Steve jobs, the alternative medicine did because he had it in his head that we can take care of this problem, uh, by, you know, it's like, okay, well, you know, no, do what you need to do, do the right thing. And, and that's, that's where, that's where I get frustrated at all of the, uh, all the problems with uh, like alternative medicine. It gets in the way. If you want to be on the side, you know, I don't have a problem with somebody, you know, burning essential oils or whatever in, in their house. As long as you're getting your them. chemotherapy as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, don't, don't skip the chemo so that you can smell lavender, you know? <laughs> yeah. I, um, I do, I, I do understand. I also think that there's probably a threshold here. If you've hurt your internal rotation of your shoulder, and you, that's that's the degree to which you're playing fuckery with typical versus non-typical solutions for it. Okay, the externalities there aren't too bad. If you're playing yeah. with, I've got pancreatic cancer, it feels like it's a little bit more of a serious discussion and you should, I don't know, maybe, maybe go with modern medicine. But yeah. it, it, it seems generally at the moment that there is a... I, I'm going to be interested to find out what happens post-pandemic generally around... Um, people's views of typical medicine big pharma overall you know we we already had the seeds sowed um with people being disgruntled to do with uh opioid addiction for pain medicines we recently had that uh what was that series about the family that created oxycodone that was oh really, yeah the sacklers yes yeah. there was there's been like i think a documentary a real documentary and a 
dramatized series that's kind of like a quasi documentary about them yeah. and it just seems like we there there is probably going to be and the problem with this is right that when it comes to do i really need this tablet to fix my back pain can you not just refer me to a pt um that is a virtuous skepticism around big pharma and yet you're there's how much babies going out with the bathwater here does this lead yeah. to people maybe not getting uh cancer treatments that they really really need and steve's jobs in it it's a difficult one man this is one of the things and we're seeing this everywhere the the danger and the challenge of just lots of information we presumed that people who were better informed who had access to an unlimited amount of information would be able to get better outcomes mm. Kind of not the case, right? Because for every no. good thing that's out there, there's maybe five or six contrary, conflicting, mutually conflicting bad things. So yeah. more information isn't always the solution. I, I, exactly. And if you don't know how to process information, you're going to be a victim of bad information. And that's kind of the, one of the things that we try to focus on since we don't necessarily do martial arts as much anymore because i mean honestly it's not an existential threat there's bigger things going on in the world we're focused on self-defense against bullshit that's what bullshito is doing now because we're trying to teach people how to think to, to be responsible consumers of information because if you don't have the tools to defend yourself against all that bullshit you're going to be somebody else's tool yourself you're going to be they're going to manipulate you into voting against your own interests to buying products you don't need to, to living a lifestyle that is inauthentic and so it, it, there's just so many, our, our whole system from the ground up is, is almost predatory in a way. And so I understand how people are like skeptical. It's like, I don't believe anyone with this amount of power. I don't, you know, farm, pharmaceutical industry is out there and they're trying to make profits and they don't do not, they legitimately do not give a crap about the, the end user. It's not, they're not ethical entities and you can't like, you're not going to try a pharmaceutical company for, for murder. You're, you can't put them in jail. You, you can't, you know, can't even uh, capital punishment. You can't execute a company, uh, not, at least not in the system that we have. So I get it. I understand the skepticism. So I, what I want to do is, I mean, what everyone sort of has a moral obligation to do is go train train their, their, their understanding of how to read news, how to parse news, how to, how to see, okay, this is agenda driven bullshit. This is what is this agenda? Cause everybody has an agenda, but where is the actual underlying fact in all of that sort through that and try and find the, the actual path to navigate through that. Cause it's and the saddest part about it. The, as I, as I think about it is that most people don't have the free time. They don't, they're busy living their lives. They're busy trying to enjoy those lives. And, and so even the few people that are out there like, you know, uh, wired in a weird way to, to be, you know, like, like I am to, to try and say, no, 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 this is BS. This is BS. I mean, what's my agenda? I mean, are you going to believe me? Because I'm not you. I have my own thoughts and priorities and stuff like that. So it's, it's hard. So, I mean, we, we have to be better at, at communicators and as a community, uh, it, like to, push the bad actors out or at least marginalize them and, and to try and have conversations so that we reach the people that, that are, have questions, legitimate questions and concerns and fears. And, and because those are the pe first people that get preyed on by the, uh, by the grifters, the con artists, the, uh, the, the mustache twirling assholes and the, you know, and the big pharma companies and that kind of thing. Yeah. So the and top hats and bad. their canes that they're twiddling yes. along. Yeah. I understand. They're, it's, um, it's never been so difficult to be, a person just trying to work out what the fuck's going on, you know? Yeah. Now, yeah. I don't know, maybe in the past, the information that you would have got b by your local baron or whatever <laughs> would have probably not been very truthful, but at least it wasn't on you if it was... It, you didn't need a sophisticated sense-making apparatus to try and actually discern what was happening. And I can't yeah. work out... I can't, I, it's a genuine question whether or not it's better to live in a world with suboptimally accurate information which you don't need to spend most of your time trying to discern or a world in which you have access to all of the information but 
every single mistake that you make is on your head because you didn't do enough fact checking before you decided to make a decision. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't think we're going to be able to escape that unless we just sort of have some kind of uh, apocalypse and we regress back to the fuck it. I'm in for Mad Max. I'm in for Mad Max. (laughs) Fuck it. Let's do it. Look, ladies and gentlemen, Frost, it's been a pleasure. Where should people go if they want to check out your stuff? Um, uh, I'm on Twitter at P H R O S T, uh, but bullshito, uh, net is the website. We have podcast, uh, we, we live stream on Twitch and that kind of thing. And so, uh, we have forums on bullshito.net, uh, forums are still okay. They're, they're not the, 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 as cool as like, you know, Twitter and stuff like that for, for the cool kids. But I think we can have better conversations on that. And I wish everybody would engage more on that kind of medium. But, uh, other than that, yeah. Hey, just, uh, do your own, you know, research, you know, <laughs> So I appreciate you. Cheers, man. All right. Thanks, man. It's been great. What's happening, people? Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that episode, then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few weeks. And don't forget to subscribe. Peace.